uh, Albert Einstein is reputed to have said that uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Now, there are two problems with this quote. Um, the first is that that's a really bad definition of insanity. I hope to God Einstein didn't say that. That's really a better definition of foolishness. Fortunately, Einstein didn't say it. It might have been Charlie Brown. I don't know. But you know, the internet just tends to get credit wrong like that. Anyway, but it's a useful phrase. Um, and I think it's really what we've all three been, uh, been wrestling with here. Why is it that people embrace very, very bad economic ideas generation after generation? And I think evolution is crucial in understanding why that is. Uh, and so the adapted mind and the work of John and Lita, which really created the field or opened up the field for psychologists to use evolutionary thinking and evolutionary tools, they made it possible for us to think about human nature as Walt Whitman would have said, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes of apps and motives. I think that's the way he put it, I'm not sure. I, it was from memory. Um, now actually, I didn't get the memo about the Swiss Army knife being out, so I, sorry, I, that's outdated. Um, but thinking about our minds as having just lots of stuff in it, which reflects our evolutionary preparedness for this lifelong camping trip that we were on, um, and now we live in a different way, is a very, very helpful way to think about human nature and to understand puzzles, especially recurrent puzzles. When the same puzzles and problems and, and foolishness crop up over and over again, generation after generation, it's a good idea to look to human nature to figure out why. Um, a very short summary would be that it's so clear to me, studying moral psychology, that we evolved to do tribalism. We have an enormous evolutionary heritage for tribalism. We also evolved to trade. We do have that as well. What we don't have is any evolutionary heritage that helps us or makes it easy for us to understand economics or evolution. Now, um, I'm going to talk more about some of these moral foundations. John and Lita both mentioned uh, the importance of policies meshing or not meshing with our evolved moral intuitions, moral foundations. So I'll talk about these topics. First, the foundations of morality. So my own research is on uh, where morality comes from, how it works, how it develops across cultures. And in my, uh, in my last book, I boiled moral psychology down to three Three principles. If you understand these three principles, you understand moral psychology. Um, I don't have time to go through all three today. I'm going to focus on the middle one, uh, that there are six intuitive foundations of morality. Now, when I was in graduate school, I was just so amazed that morality is so different around the world, yet bits and pieces are so similar even in communities, uh, cultures that could never have communicated. And I tried to reconcile this. How can the insights of anthropology about variation be reconciled with what I was reading in evolutionary psychology about human universals? And I just tried to map out, well, what are the, what are the issues that the anthropologists all talk about in their ethnographies and that the evolutionists have a good explanation for how it came about? I didn't want to make any just so stories myself. I wanted to take off the shelf evolutionary thinking and connect it to anthropological variation. And these, uh, my colleagues and I believe, are the best six candidates. There's more, but these are the six really clear cases where humanity seems to have something, some sort of app that makes us sensitive to certain environmental conditions. So I'll run through these. Actually, for today, I'm only going to focus on the first three. That's what we need to understand economic policy. I'll briefly mention the others. So care. Um, we are mammals, and what that means by definition is mammary glands, which means that we nurse our young, which means that not just the female body is adapted for this long childhood, but the female mind is adapted. And in humans and others that have male investment, the male mind is adapted as well. So we care, we are moved, we are hurt, we, we feel compassion when we see a helpless, innocent creature suffering. This is clearly part of human nature. There's a lot of evolutionary writing about attachment theory from John Bowlby and others. Now, does all of this, all of this software, all of these apps, do they play a role in our political lives? Of course they do. These are photos that uh, Emily Eakins and I took at Occupy Wall Street. And you see a lot of stuff at Occupy uh, about compassion, uh, free empathy, compassion is our new currency, I can't hurt another without hurting myself. I'm not saying that conservatives uh, don't feel compassion, I'm not saying that they um, don't love their children or their dogs, but they don't base their political ideology or program suggestions on empathy in the same way that the left does. Um, here is a quote, it's funny, I just was, uh, I, I'm teaching a business ethics course. Two days ago, one of my students from India, we were talking after class and he said, I was surprised to find that so many MBA students here at Stern support Sanders. They say his economic ideas are silly, but we need someone empathetic and honest. 
So again, if you're on the left, empathy is the proper foundation for moral and political programs. Second foundation, fairness and cheating. Long, a lot of evolutionary writing on reciprocal altruism from uh, Robert Trivers and others. Um, on the left, fairness tends, fairness has many meanings. But on the left, uh, one of the meanings that really comes to the fore politically is the idea of equality. Equality is a kind of fairness. So if the 1% own 43%, that is ipso facto, prima facie, unfair. And you don't even need to ask if maybe you know, Steve Jobs created a billion times more value than, than I did. Um, another sign, marching for the meek and weary, hungry and homeless. Tax the wealthy, fair and square. Now, everybody believes that the rich should be taxed fairly. But what does fairness mean? According to this sign, as you see on the bottom, how can they let us go hungry every day? So fair taxation is taxing until there is not hunger anymore. That would be fair because that would lead to um, equality. It's linked to care. This is a cartoon that's made the rounds on the internet over, over the last few years. If you just look at it, it makes a lot of sense. I find it very emotionally powerful. And I thought about this for a long time until I realized the reason it's so emotionally powerful, I think, is because it looks like they're brothers. And within a family, as, as Lita said, uh, you know, common pool resources, communal sharing, within a family, of course you want to do whatever it takes that everybody gets to enjoy the game. Um, within families, we are indeed collectivists on most matters. But if we were to extend this out to the whole country or the whole planet, it would mean um, that as long as there is someone who can't see, we must take from those who can see. Same thing with money. So I think that if you understand the moral emotions, you can see why certain images can be so powerful. But sometimes they don't mean exactly what, uh, what you might think at first. Uh, what we find empirically is that uh, conservatives see fairness very differently. They tend to focus on proportionality. Uh, these are photos Emily took, Emily Eakins took uh, at a Tea Party rally. Stop punishing success with a, a progressive tax rate. Stop rewarding failure with welfare and, and bailing people out. Um, so it seems much colder and harder, but again, if you're going to try to get cooperation going and you want to stop free riders, this is the kind of fairness that you need. Third foundation, liberty and oppression. And the key psychology here comes from a wonderful book by uh, Christopher Bohm called Hierarchy in the Forest. He studied a variety of tribal groups as well as chimpanzees. And he documents what he calls a reverse dominance hierarchy that even among uh, chimpanzees, but certainly among humans, it, it, they're very, uh, well, human hunter-gatherer groups are very egalitarian, but he says they are obsessive about anybody acting like an alpha. If one person rises up, it's not that just that others dislike them, it's that there's an urge to band together and take him down. And once you understand that urge as, a, as an app, as a response to bullying or an, al uh, an aggressive alpha male, now you can understand the flag of Virginia. I moved, I was at UVA for 16 years. It took me a while to notice that there's a dead person on the flag. Now, why would there be a dead person on your flag? Because the flag was created in 1770 something when the American, I should say the English people living in North America rebelled against the English king and they had to justify. Sick semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. It's exactly what Bohm talks about. The Declaration of Independence is a long list of the grievances justifying our taking him down, getting rid of him. And now you can understand this image from Occupy Wall Street. If the 99% could get together, they could crush and kill the 1%. Again, it's exactly the mechanism that Bohm is talking about. It's an app that got, gets triggered in some people, not in others. Now, uh, here there's some real left-right symmetry. Uh, the Tea Party sees government as the bully and oppressor, um, and the, while, whereas the, the left sees the rich and corporations. So there's a lot of similarity. You just have a different oppressor. Um, we have a lot of data on this, on how people vary by, uh, politically on these moral foundations. Uh, at my, if you go to yourmorals.org, you can take our surveys. I'll just show you a summary of our major survey that gives you scores on all the different moral foundations. And what you can see is that when, uh, when people come to our site and they register and they say that they're on the right, um, they actually give fairly high scores on all of these foundations. They endorse all of them. Now here I've graphed out fairness as proportionality. If I'd put equality, it would have sloped the other way. But I don't think there is an equality foundation. When people come to our site and they say they're on the left, they prioritize care. Very high scores on all questions about care and compassion and nurturing. Um, that is the dominant aspect of their morality. Fairness and liberty actually take second place to care. Uh, you can see this in a sign that Emily and I saw at, uh, at Occupy. Equality now, liberty later. 
Um, I found that libertarians love this sign. They love to put it in all the <laughs> magazines and things like that. Um, so if these are, we all have the same moral foundations, but for a variety of reasons, be it personal differences or the ideological stories you buy into, we build moralities on different sets of foundations. Um, let me now talk about libertarians, because if our goal here is to understand the eternal attraction of socialism, and we're actually saying it's sort of normal human psychology, it's quite useful to turn it around and say, well, who are these libertarians? What, what's up with them? Why is it that they are so opposed to socialism? And my group happens to have, I think, the best data set in the world on libertarian psychology. Um, first, I'll start by noting, as we all know, libertarians are not conservatives. As uh, Senator Hatch said when he was challenged by some libertarians in a primary, these people are not conservatives, they're not Republicans, they're radical libertarians, and I'm doggone offended by it. I despise these people. Now, um, so my colleagues and I at, at yourmorals.org, we have, we have uh, hundreds of surveys that we've put up online. We've had a half million people come to the site and fill them out, which means that we have, it's not nationally representative data. So our sampling is terrible, but our measurement is superb. There's always that trade-off. Um, <laughs> so we have data from lots of people on lots of studies. So we were able to draw from that because we also do something that few other places do. When you come and you register, a lot of places don't even ask politics. In fact, I'd love to know in your data on the the variance, whether you know left, right, did you measure their politics in that study? Um, in who go, in whether they, in the, uh, the avatar game, where they, who do oh, they reassign to? Research, so I oh, okay, well, you, okay, but in, in all of your search, I would urge you to, to okay. Um, so, at, uh, so at your morals, when people come to register, you can say that you are a liberal or on the left. I try to say progressive nowadays, but we used to, we used to say liberal. Um, uh, or whether you're on the right, and then we offer the option of saying libertarian, because libertarians cannot easily be placed normally on that dimension. As a result, we have data from tens of thousands of libertarians, which Gallup and other places generally don't, they don't generally ask that. So in the data I'm about to show you, <clears throat> um, about 12,000 libertarians, 80% male, and that is significant. Among the liberals, it's only 49% male. Um, so uh, we made up some, this is how we actually uh, did our original research into the Liberty Foundation. We, we, we generated a bunch of items about economic liberty, like people who are successful in business should have a right to enjoy their wealth. Lifestyle liberty, a little different. I think everyone should be free to do as they choose, so long as they don't infringe upon the equal freedom of others. And what you see here is data graphed out by whether you're any of the left categories in blue, the right categories in red, or if you're libertarian. And when we look at the lifestyle liberty, we see that libertarians are highest. They're highest on both kinds. But they're highest and joined uh, by liberals in questions that have anything to do about sexual freedom, LGBT rights, things like that. So uh, libertarians and progressives are often allies. But if we look at economic matters, it's different. There, libertarians are highest again, but they're joined with conservatives. This is, and the gap with the left is huge on these economic liberty items. This is why I think libertarians more typically vote Republican than Democrat. <clears throat> um, the other trait that I'll tell you about, but we've looked at a lot of them, this is the sort of the master trait that summarizes all the others, I'd say. Uh, Simon Baron Cohen, the leading autism researcher, uh, says that um, we all start off as, well, as a fact, we all start off as girls in utero, but then if a Y chromosome is present, a little bit of testosterone pulses out, changes the body and brain. When the brain is changed from the female pattern over to the male pattern, it seems on average that the brain changes so that it gets a little better at systemizing, at thinking about uh, analyzing variables in a system, deriving underlying rules, um, and it gets a little worse at empathizing um, about identifying another person's emotions, thoughts, uh, and uh, things like that. So there is an average male-female difference. Baron Cohen says that autism is really just if you're really high on systemizing and really low on empathizing, that's what we call you're at one end on the autism spectrum. Um, so this is sort of a master personality variable for cognitive kinds of traits. And here's the data. Uh, so we, we took about half of his items. It's a very long survey. And what you see is that libertarians are the highest on systemizing. And libertarians are the lowest on empathizing, those black bars in the middle. Libertarians, in fact, are the only group of the three groups for whom their scores on these surveys were actually higher on systemizing than empathizing in terms of their absolute scores. Progressives are the opposite. So libertarians have what you might call the most masculine cognitive style. It doesn't mean they're macho. It just means that on all the kinds of cognitive traits where you find a male-female difference, libertarians are more male. And we do these analyses within sex. So even if you just look at women, women who 
are attracted to libertarianism have a much more masculine cognitive style than women who are attracted to progressivism. Um, in sum, libertarians are the highest on all traits related to rationality and intelligence, um, but they are the lowest on all traits related to emotionality. There's one exception, there's one emotion on which libertarians rule. That is the emotion of reactance. Reactance is the anger you feel when someone tells you that you can't do something or when they try to control you. <laughs> so here are the questions in the survey. I find contradicting others stimulating. I don't know about if how many people are here from Cato, but I would guess that Cato, uh, people who work at Cato probably will score higher on that than people who work at, at other think tanks. Um, when something is prohibited, I usually think that's exactly what I'm going to do, like this. So here's a sort of a quintessential example of reactance uh, when the soda ban was reversed. Um, so libertarians value liberty more, and they value uh, most other moral values less uh, compared to progressives or conservatives. They rely on reason more and emotion less, and they have the most masculine cognitive style. So this, I think, helps us. We, we can see how even though we all have the same apps, they either have different settings or some are on the home screen. Others, you know, for, for progressive, you'd have to kind of swipe, 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 swipe before you find. Uh, so, uh, so, and, so, all right. Um, so that's all I'll say about libertarians. Now, the third thing is uh, let's talk briefly about collective narratives. I think this helps why there's an enduring appeal and why a certain mindset takes over institutions such as the academy or Wall Street for that matter. Um, so collective narratives. Uh, my favorite quote in all of the social sciences, if I had to pick one, is this from Clifford Geertz, paraphrasing Max Weber. Man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. That's what social life is. We kind of make it up and then we live in it. And uh, many of you will recognize this is essentially what William Gibson was doing when he created those books and then the movies about the Matrix. The Matrix, he said, is a consensual hallucination. Now, as a social scientist, as a social psychologist, this is just beautiful because this is what we study, is how do we hallucinate this? And then why does it have such a grip on us? But it does. Um, when I moved to the business school at, at uh, NYU um, in 2011, I had no interest in business. I just wanted to be in New York City um, to promote the righteous mind. But I began learning about capitalism. I'd known nothing about it before, practically. I began learning about capitalism in business, and I discovered that there are two very, very different stories being told. There's the one which is dominant in most of the university and on Occupy Wall Street about capitalism is basically exploitation. And then there's the one I was learning in the business school, and, and uh, I read a history of capitalism about, no, capitalism is, is liberation. It's value creation. And I got, was fascinated by these because both are formed into totally cohesive, self-contained narratives that are demonstrably true. All you have to do is look at the newspaper and you can see how true this story is. But they're two different incompatible stories. And over time, I sort of animated these into a PowerPoint talk and then I hired somebody to turn that into a video. So I'm gonna show you now two 90 second videos. Um, just before we start, please what you do is so reach into your head, set your uh, switches, um, turn your care and fairness settings up to 11 please. And if you have a systemizing switch, turn that down to three. Okay, got it? All right, roll the video, please. All right, or maybe I do it by here, let's see. Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops, and craftsmen made goods with their own hands. <coughs> but then, capitalism was invented, and darkness spread across the land as the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution covered everything in soot. The capitalists became ever more skilled at extracting productivity from workers and pocketing the gains from their labor. The workers eventually fought back by unionizing. In the early 20th century, as the brutality and stupidity of capitalism were exposed, many governments granted workers some protection <coughs> from the predators. Democratic welfare states were born. But the capitalists and their right-wing cronies were unrelenting. And in many countries, they have destroyed the unions slashed regulations, and given the corporations free reign to exploit at will. So, the rich get richer, the rest of us get poorer, our democracy gets weaker, and the planet gets hotter. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight against global capitalism and the super predators it has unleashed upon us. Okay, so that's a coherent story. It has a once upon a time, it has a clear villain, it has a trajectory, and it tells you what we need to do. 
Now I'll show you the second story. And what I want you to note is it's exactly the same structure. I literally wrote out a table with two columns and certain slots. I just plugged in different content. But it's the same structure. Oh, uh, and before you watch, please turn your liberty and systemizing up to 11 and turn care and empathizing down to three. Enjoy the show. Once upon a time, almost everyone was a peasant, a serf, or a slave. Kings and feudal lords took most of what people produced, so nobody had much reason to work hard. But then in the 17th century, capitalism was invented and the liberation began. In England, Holland, and America, they discovered that when you give people property rights, the rule of law, and free markets, you turn on a switch in their hearts. People want to work when they can keep the fruits of their labor. They want to invent new products, provide for their children, and be useful to others. Free market capitalism enables them to do these things. In the 20th century, some countries embraced communism and centralized planning, always with the same result. Shortages of everything, including food and freedom. But countries that embraced capitalism have grown prosperous in a single generation. Yet, despite the evidence of history, the left-wing egalitarians are unrelenting. And whenever they get control of a government, their first target is economic freedom. The egalitarians don't want to live in a world in which people who create more value for others get to enjoy more wealth for themselves. They'd rather that everyone be equal and equally poor. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight to protect capitalism and to extend its blessings to all of humankind. Okay, well, I could take a vote on which one uh, you prefer, but I think that's probably not necessary. Um, all right, so if there are these two coherent stories that are organizing political groups, political parties, um, well, not necessarily parties, but if there are these coherent stories out there, what do we do? Is there a way forward? Um, do we need a third story? Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but I think that it's important for all of us to recognize that both of these stories actually have a lot of truth to them. Even if you, even if you prefer one, the other one does have some real truth to it. What I'm finding is I'm, I'm traveling around many countries, I'm writing a book on morality and capitalism, and I'm finding that across countries, the left generally stands for decency even at the cost of dynamism, and the right generally stands for dynamism even at the cost of decency. Um, and so just from the last couple days while I was preparing this talk, um, American capitalism, uh, uh, has, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of humiliation, there is a lot of suffering, there are a lot of people who fall through the cracks. Uh, certainly from a European perspective, we have embraced dynamism to the point of ignoring uh, decency. This was just this morning on the plane down. I, uh, you know, a new, all these leaks going on, some very clear examples in Wisconsin of exactly how corporations bought legislation. So there's a lot of truth to that first story. Um, uh, and so I understand why they say, look, we, you know, if you just have unbridled freedom, this is what you get, is this kind of corruption. This is why we need to enforce, we need to get more equality. I understand that. Um, but I also came across, while preparing this talk, this quote from Milton Friedman. A society that aims for equality before liberty will end up with neither equality nor liberty. Uh, it always ends up when the initial efforts to, force equ to create equality don't work, they end up pushing harder and harder and harder. And a society that aims first for liberty will not end up with equality, but it will end up with a closer approach to equality than any other kind of system that has ever been developed. So I think it's certainly worth at least uh, uh, meditating on that. It seems like it is true to me. Um, so what can we do so that we don't have this eternal groundhog day of recurrence of bad economic thinking? I have four suggestions. The first is, boy, it sure would help if we could reduce the role of money in politics and make that first story less true about how uh, power and legislation happen in this country. Uh, second, I've been reading Yuval Levin's uh, wonderful uh, book, Fractured Republic, and I'm now a big fan, not just of his, but of, his, uh, of the importance of subsidiarity, of having things dealt with at the lowest level possible, not kicking it up to the federal government, which is, has a terrible record of solving problems. So subsidiarity combined with a general orientation towards experimentation. Let's try a program. And if it really does undermine and have perverse incentives, we'll know it and then we'll stop. We won't just roll it out to the whole country. So subsidiarity plus experimentalism as, as the way to deal with social problems, I think would give us much better economic, econo economically sound uh, policy and uh, programs. Uh, 
Third, if I were, uh, if I were king and uh, there were no constitutional limits on what I could do, I would uh, reduce the amount of math we make kids learn. It's a kind of a 19th century idea that if we make them exercise their brain on this, they'll get smarter. It's not true. Even scientists don't generally need that much math. What we need is a populace that is literate in analytical thinking. And so a year of statistics and a year of economics would do wonders for economic thinking, as we saw in, uh, in John's example of a single economics course as an undergraduate. Um, uh, my fourth suggestion is that I think we need to increase viewpoint diversity in the academy. Um, as we've heard, the, uh, uh, there's a kind of a, a very much pro-socialist way of thinking in most department, in many departments at universities. Uh, we need to expose students to at least a variety of ways of thinking. This graph shows how the academy has changed uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. The left-right ratio used to be just two to one. As late as 1996, a representative sample of all professors, in 1996, the blue line on top is people who said they were on the left, only twice as many people on the left as the right. And that's fine with me. I don't care about equality. I just want to make sure that if someone says something from a leftist or rightist perspective, someone out there will challenge it. That's what I want. Um, but over the next 15 years, things had changed. Now it's five to one. And most of the non-leftists there are in engineering schools or dental schools. If you look at the core areas of the humanities and social scientists, it's between 10 to one and 50 to one, left to right. That's why um, I and some other colleagues started an organization called Heterodox Academy. Lita and John are members. And any professors who are out there watching this talk, I urge you to go to heterodoxacademy.org and join. Uh, we're just trying to say diversity is good. Shouldn't we have diversity of thinking? <clears throat> so um, if we can do those things, I think and hope that we will have at least a little less foolishness going forward. Thank you. <laughs>